Welcome everyone to the third family education webinar provided by the Family Medical Coping Initiative at Boston Children's Hospital. And thank you so much for joining us. If you're interested in viewing our two prior family webinars, the first is helping your child manage anxiety about vaccinations and other pokes. The other is helping your child with questions, staring, teasing, and bullying about their medical illness or difference. Those can be accessed on the Boston Children's Hospital YouTube channel. So just for an overview, the Family Medical Coping Initiative is a new program through the Dale Family Center for Families at Boston Children's and a multidisciplinary effort of spearheaded by psychology, social work, and child life. The program was developed to provide education to families and staff about ways to enhance child and family coping with the impact of children's medical conditions, medical procedures, and interactions with the healthcare environment. Today's webinar is presented by the Family Medical Coping Initiative team, and I'm delighted to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Elise Bronfman, who is a psychologist who's been working with medically ill children at Boston Children's Hospital for 23 years, and Gail Windmuller, a certified child life specialist who's been at Boston Children's working with a wide variety of patients for more than a decade. And I'm Annie Banks. I'm a social worker in the Hale Family Center for Families. And I've been working with families in medical settings for more than 30 years. Uh, we are all also parents and Gail is a grandparent who have dealt with coping with our own and our children's medical conditions and the challenges of sticking to medical recommendations. We hope we can help you with that today with an overview of some of the ways of thinking about and managing these challenges. For a little housekeeping, I'll let you know I will be here monitoring your questions in the chat. Um, feel free to send them along during the presentation or during the question period at the end. And we may not be able to answer your questions about your individual circumstance, um, but we welcome general questions about the topic. And if we don't get to all of your questions here, don't worry, we'll follow up with you via email sometime after the presentation. For administrative reasons, that can take a while, but we'll certainly follow up. And this presentation is also being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within several days of the presentation. With all that said, so let's begin. Um, what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna talk about the difference between adherence and compliance and why that's important coping with feelings about illness and life changes, building an alliance with the medical team, and overcoming barriers to a variety of common medical recommendations, including swallowing pills, using needles at home, applying creams, restricting activity, performing exercises, and meeting dietary and liquid requirements. So what's the difference between adherence and compliance and why do we care? Well, compliance to medical recommendations is a term that was used most often until recently and it involves obedience to another person's recommendation. The flip side of obedience, of course, is pushing back. So we prefer to use the term adherence and you will probably hear that more from your child's providers now. Adherence implies an active, positive choice to engage in steady follow through with the plan. And it's not about being good or being bad, it's about finding ways to stick to the plan over time. Why don't children and families follow their doctor's orders? Well, there are plenty of reasons. Um, the cost of medicine and or other treatments, and if that's um, a burden, um, please try to speak with a social worker in a clinical area to see if uh, there's any help available the inconvenience of following through with plans, uh, simple wish that the problem didn't exist, difficulty with change for the patient and the family, which can be huge. A medical plan can change the daily life of a family. Discomfort, embarrassment, difficulty with organization, lack of understanding or skill, which can be developed, complex multi-step recommendations, fear about what medicine or treatment will do, such as side effects, procrastination, just putting off what you don't wanna do, and difficulty balancing cultural personal beliefs with medical plans. For example, uh, certain religious and cultural groups are not inclined to accept blood products 
or person might be concerned about treatments that are human made, this is natural. So the first step in dealing with a new medical plan is coping with feelings about the plan. You really need to think about feelings and acknowledge them before embarking on the change because change is hard for caregivers and kids. So we should allow for a range of feelings for our children and for ourselves. Shock, anger, distress, sadness, denial, worry, and sometimes relief. Relief can come actually from actually knowing a diagnosis when you didn't have one, or finally having a way of addressing a medical difficulty when you didn't have one before. You should really talk about the changes and how they're going to affect you and your child. And we'll be talking with you a little bit more about that later in this presentation. And discuss how to make the new plan work for you and your child. Remember both caregivers and kids need support through periods of change. So even sometimes with small changes. So some options are sharing your experience with family or friends who you can talk to, joining support groups of others who are coping with similar concerns. Spiritual care or ritual is valued by a lot of people going through change. Activities, for instance, being physical or participating activities that you and your child enjoy. There are camps for individual children or, for, or there are family camps that are organized around disease groups and psychotherapy. Sometimes it's really just helpful to have a private space with a skilled clinician to process feelings and uh, facilitate adjustment. That can be for you, private and away from your child or for your child, have a private space away from you or you can engage in psychotherapy as a family if the changes are really difficult and you need someone to help us. And now I'm gonna pass things over to Elisa. Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar. So I think the question um, first comes to play is what lifestyle changes are necessary in order to promote the healthiest, best outcome for you and your child? And that, that's what we want. We want the best outcomes uh, medically for kids. And that's why recommendations and changes are made because it's meant to get a, the best outcome. Uh, part of that really starts with conversations and conversations with your child about what's going on with their body that helps them to understand what they're being asked to do. And also in part, so you also understand what you're asking them to do. So questions that could be part of a really healthy conversation with a child taking into account their development. So you have to consider where they are developmentally, what kind of language skills they have, how old they are, how they're going to feel about the conversation. So this would be a very uh, different conversation with a neurotypical 17 year old than with a five year old or with someone who's struggling to understand these concepts, just to keep that in mind. But with when taking into account their developmental level, asking why is a new plan needed? What does it involve? Um, how will it help? Why is it helpful? How long will it be in place, especially if it's not forever? How long will it be in place? What will remain the same? What parts are easy and what parts are hard? And what will help um, the whole family, child in particular, to stick to the plan? I'm going to say that part about how long will it be in place. Sometimes kids have ideas that aren't correct about how long things will be in place. And some of these distortions are really important to review with them. So I know it's a lot to ask for parents. We're going to ask you to model some healthy coping for your for your child. And um, part of that is taking care of yourself and them seeing that you're getting uh, enough water, that you're exercising, that you're taking care of your needs. And a lot of times parents, if children are taking a medicine, might take a multivitamin and say to their child, I, here, I'm taking my vitamins so I can keep my body healthy too. The idea that everybody has steps they can take to keep their body healthy is a good, uh, is a good concept as well. Uh, discussing overcoming life challenges, how hard it is to try something new. And that could be something in your own medical world or your own body, but it could also be even I had a new job and that was hard at first. It took me a while to get used to it, that kind of thing. And this idea of talking out loud or about following through, okay, I'm taking my medicine now, all right, I'm doing my exercises now, 
all of these things are useful for the kids to see you doing as well. So creating a healthy story uh, about succeeding and follow through. So uh, part of it is we want them to develop a narrative or, or a story about their lives that things happen and change and that that's expected, but what? But it's how you manage those changes. So after you've discussed your child's feelings and fears, help them develop um, as a positive a way as possible to think about the, med about the medical recommendation. So I was scared at first to take a, a medicine. Now it makes, I see that it makes my body work better. Uh, working with your child to identify ways in which the illness does and does not interfere with their lives. So uh, for example, I have to take a break from basketball, but I can go to sewing class or something else, whatever their interest is. These are just examples that we're coming up against because many times kids focus on what they can't do, but remembering to focus on what they still can do as well. Uh, finding ways to make recommendations part of regular family life. For example, if your child has celiac disease, maybe you go to the gluten-free bakery every Sunday morning. Uh, finding a way to build in the things that you need to do into your life, beginning to develop a consistent plan for follow through. So if something happens regularly, it's more likely to happen. If your child needs to do PT exercises, if they always happen right before school, that makes it more likely to happen. If everybody knows and has a shared expectation of when and how something will happen, that helps it happen. So building an alliance with your medical team. Um, it's easier to follow through with a medical recommendation when you and your child have a relationship and trust your medical team. So part of that is sharing your story with the members of the team that you have at Boston Children's Hospital or wherever you're getting your medical care. So being open about sharing your story and also asking questions and asking for clarification. If you don't understand something, making sure that you and your child have a chance to, um, to ask questions. Very often with kids who are able or a little bit older, you can have them um, also think ahead of time what they would want to ask a provider. So maybe I want to ask my PT, when could I do this? Or how would you know if my muscle was getting stronger or if something was getting better? Uh, thinking about those questions with them so that they see themselves as having some power, some ability to have knowledge that helps them participate in their own uh, program. So uh, there's been I, been some controversy about this word developing medical independence because uh, some some families find that a hard word because it assumes that independence is an endpoint. But so what we're really trying to do is develop medical competence and medical choices. So how do we begin to teach your children that ways to take steps towards having greater power in the medical system? Uh, with kids who have limited language skills, it might even be being able to, to learn the skill of pointing to where they're having pain or being able to understand or, or look and smile at a doctor and feel okay coming to the hospital. But in general, what we want to do is help kids learn the different kinds of providers. How is a PT different than, um, than a pediatrician, for example? Or how is a pediatrician different than uh, a GI expert. Anyway, any way you're thinking of it, helping them understand who the people who are helping them are and what they do. I think it's also very useful for them to know their provider's names. Uh, I learned participating in check-in. When my daughter was 17, I said to her, why don't you go check in? And she said, how do you do that? And I was absolutely shocked that after 17 years of going to doctors that she didn't have an idea of how to do that. So uh, I think I should have started that sooner, but having them participate and walk with you to check in and say their name and hand the card, all of those things are good things to start when they're able and ready and interested. Helping them ask questions and decide what they want to ask about and advocate for themselves. Um, encouraging them to understand the medical plan, both what it is, how they're going to do it, and why it's in place. And then it, specifically for the purpose of medication, because we're about to get into some of the very specific skills we're going to have you uh, teach kids in order to follow their medical plan. But one thing that's really important is knowing the names and reasons, shapes, and colors of their medication. What are they taking and which pill is which? Pretty critical. So um, I'm Gail, I'm gonna continue on talking about the barriers to taking medicine. And there are quite a few barriers um, that families and children face when they have a new regimen of taking medicine. 
Um, one of the things that children sometimes don't like the taste of it. Sometimes they're embarrassed that they have to take medicine, especially if it's an environment where their friends might find out and they don't want their friends to know. Um, they might be forgetful and the family might be forgetful. It's hard to establish a new routine where you'll um, always remember that you need to do something at a certain time. Um, some families feel like they should be able to just do it the, their own way, um, that things were working before they were started on this regimen and they don't want to try this new thing. Um, denial is when they just don't believe that this is happening to them and they don't want to don't want to face the fact that they have to take this medicine and um and in order to get better um some people are scared of the medicine they're wondering if there's going to be side effects or something else going on that aren't going to be you know that's going to make it more negative um a big barrier for a lot of people are pill is pill swallowing which we will talk a lot about in a little bit um and then another um, situation I know that's happened to us is that we don't realize we have any more refills available and we're out of medicine and we have to contact the doctor and it takes a few days. And so being able to keep track of when you're running out of medicine and know that you need to contact the doctor before you've run out, that's a very important thing too. Now, making a plan is the best way to follow through with the recommendations and making it so that it's in an organized way. So if your child's old enough to sit down and talk about how are we going to incorporate pill, you know, taking the pills, doing exercise, putting on cream, how are we going to integrate this into our daily schedule? And, and it's recommended that you write this down and keep track of it so that, and it can be in a chart form, it can just be in a list. And then if once you've identified that there are barriers that are getting in the way, you can alter the plan. So for example, you decide that you're gonna take your medicine at dinner time, um, but then realize that your child now has soccer practice and it turns out it's at dinner time and he's bringing a, um, a bag dinner to soccer practice. Well, how are we going to get that medicine taken on those days? And so again, you sit down and figure out how is it going to happen? And if the child's embarrassed to take it at soccer practice or might forget, then just figuring out what the plan's going to be and how you're going to manage that. Um, these are some examples of sticker charts and schedules that can help um, the first one here is for very young children, just being able to like, you know, be proud of the fact that they have done what they're supposed to do. Um, this kind of um, sticker chart is available at office supply stores. Um, there are pads of paper and they sell these tiny little stickers. And so that can be a really great reinforcement for a child. Um, this type um, is for maybe a little bit older child. They follow a path and if they've, um, done what they need to do, in this case, five times. On the sixth time, they get some kind of reward. And it doesn't have to be something that you buy. It can be that they get an extra story at bedtime, or they get to stay at the park an extra you know, 20 minutes or whatever. Um, whatever works for you and your family and whatever is meaningful to your child. So they need to be part of that decision. So because if they're working for something that they don't care about, it's not going to help reinforce their what they're doing. And then this is just a schedule of, you know, I'm going to breakfast, I'm going to get up at nine, I'm going to breakfast at 10. Um, I'm going to take my medicine at 11, whatever you're going to do, or you're going to do your exercises so that there's a daily schedule for what's going to happen. Now, um, sometimes the taste of the medicine can be the problem. And when that's the case, there are many options. Um, pharmacists can sometimes compound the, um, the medicine with different flavors. You can request that. Um, you can also chill the medicine. That sometimes if it's cold can help. Um, mixing it in with something your child likes like chocolate syrup or honey or coffee. Um, if it's a pill, um, I think, um, Elisa mentioned, you know, crunching it up. Um, she, if you have to check with your doctor about whether or not it's okay to mush up 
a pill and put it into food. Some medicines, for example, even Advil, have a coating on it so that it doesn't dissolve until it gets to your stomach. Um, otherwise, you can develop um, swords in your esophagus. So you got to make sure that the medicine that your child's taking is okay to mush up and add it to a food um, if that's something you're hoping to do. Um, so if that's the case that you can, you know, mash it up, you could put it into pudding or ice cream. Um, the other thing you can do if it's a liquid is to follow it by something that the child likes. I sometimes have to take medicine I don't like. I follow it with grapefruit juice, which is a very strong flavored juice, which I like. So it, it washes away the taste. The other um, suggestion is use sucking on a lollipop. And Jolly Ranchers are very strong flavored lollipops, um, but any lollipop will help get the taste out of the child's mouth. And it's also a treat if they get to have a lollipop. Um, making the medicine, taking the medicine at times when it's not public and not embarrassing as we had mentioned, um, organizing how and when the medicine is taken. You can purchase these medicine organizers where you put in the medicine that each um, each day needs to be taken and then keep it in a place that is convenient for when you have to take it. So if you're taking it in the morning when you get up and right before bed, you might keep it near your toothbrush because you're, you take it when you're brushing your teeth. I keep mine in the kitchen because I take my medicine after I eat breakfast. And so it, it helps me remember. And, um, and then there's shifting thoughts about medicine and Elise is going to talk a little about that. Thanks, Gail. I appreciate it. So this is gets to the essential question, which is why are they having trouble doing it? We're going to focus a lot on teaching the skill of swallowing pills for kids who don't have that skill. Kids and many adults who don't have that skill. Uh, let's let's point that out. We were talking earlier today about when did we learn to swallow pills? And sometimes it's when when you're in adulthood. But um, besides the skill, sometimes it's the thoughts people have about medication, not the skill that's an issue. So question might be um, that kids might have is, is this medicine safe? What will it do to my body? Um, why isn't it a failure? If they've been told, uh, well, for example, with, I don't know, with me and cholesterol, they say, well, if you can't lower your cholesterol number, you're going to have to take this pill. So you sort of feel like, why couldn't I? Shouldn't I have been able to do that with diet? So you have to be able to frame it as not a failure to take the medicine. And essentially, generally, this work of cognitive restructuring to sort of wonder about the thoughts people have about taking medicine. And if the problem is how they're thinking about it, working directly with those thoughts, which goes along to, let's say, your explanation of why the person is having trouble swallowing the pill is really important to know in guiding your intervention. Also, what are they fearful about? Are they worried again about the contents? Have they had a bad experience or do they typically have a bad experience like gagging um, or having a pill, feeling like a pill gets stuck in their throat or vomiting? Um, targeting those problems they have experienced is going to be very critical. Uh, I know we had a question in the um, chat about um, gagging specifically. And I think this idea, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, when you're afraid you're going to gag, that almost makes it more likely that you will gag. You almost have an automatic reflex of closing up too soon, and it makes it happen more frequently. It's so sad that the fact that you have that worry can actually make it more likely to happen. Uh, I, uh, Gail and I both um, use a very similar approach, and Annie, Gail, Annie and I, and everybody I think at the hospital who teaches this, what you start with is very small and go to larger pills. Gail's going to go over this in depth, but in general, the smaller it is, the less likely it is that you will um, that that you'll have a negative experience. We're trying to teach this the skill progressively, starting small, building building bigger. But part of the reason that I uh, add in something I learned from my colleagues years ago is to add in many um, like cut up marshmallows. So if you're vegan or you can't have marshmallows for religious reasons or for other reasons, you could there are vegan marshmallows as well. And to cut a tiny piece off that mini marshmallow. And sometimes um, this is especially good for people who are worried about gagging because then it doesn't hurt if you gag on a mini marshmallow when you're practicing. And it's actually hard to almost aim and hit that marshmallow when you are um, practicing and doing this. So starting with the mini marshmallows is a really good one, especially for people who are worried about that gag reflux and, and see how it feels. And again, eat with all of these candies, letting them eat some of those as well, to start, but starting with the smallest possible sliver of a mini marshmallow and then progressing to the candies as Gail is going to tell you more about. 
right? So um, to get comfortable with swallowing pills, um, the first thing that um, families can do is figure out what is the pill size that they their child is going to take um, and then matching that with a candy. And I'll show you the chart in a little bit. Um, but the, the main idea is that you start with a small candy and then slowly move on to larger, trying to swallow larger candies until you reach the size of the pill, a candy that's equal to the size of the pill. And if you're going, if the child needs to take capsules to ask um, for empty capsules to be able to practice with that. Um, kids can experiment with different, putting the pill on different parts of their tongue, um, trying to push it back, seeing what works best for them. They can experiment with drinking in different ways, having long um, continuous drink versus taking sips, um, using a cup with a straw or a water bottle. Um, and sometimes rewards can be helpful. And often you could th the candy themselves, being able to eat the candy, because when you're swallowing the candy, you don't taste them. Um, but when you get a chance to eat some of them, that can be a reward in itself. And of course, the whole idea that you've accomplished swallowing a candy that's even tiny is a big reward. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling reward. So this is a chart of different candy suggestions. Um, and in this chart, the child would start with just trying to gulp some water. And then nerds are a candy that um, if you pour them out, you can see that there's some very tiny ones and then there's bigger ones. And what we recommend is you have your child pick small nerds to start with and put it on their tongue and push it back into the further back in their mouth and take a, a sip of water and seeing if, the, if it'll go down. And usually after a few tries, if you explain to your child, you know, don't, don't try to hold the candy with your tongue up at the roof of your mouth, but just forget it's there and drink, it, they'll be successful. And they should try to do that three times in a row before moving on to a larger size nerd. Um, we found that with three times in a row, they have confidence they can do it. And the next size will be easier to deal with and the kids will have confidence. And also then they can eat a few little tiny nerds <laughs> before they go on to the next size. Um, and you continue that way until you come to a candy that's the size of the medicine the child needs to swallow. So for example, if your child were trying to swallow an Advil, they're about the size of a mini M&M. So the goal would be to the fourth to here. You might circle this as that's your goal. If they're trying to take Tylenol, it might be Tic Tacs. Um, some pills are really big and they could be as big as good and plenty. But if your child needs to just take a small medicine, they don't need to learn how to swallow good and plenty until later on when they're more comfortable with the ones that they have to take. Um, and the other thing that's kind of fun is to just give your child a certificate that they've done this and that they're, um, you know, it's an easy, simple congratulations. You're now you're a champion pill swallower. And a lot of kids feel really great when they get to hang something up on their wall that you know reminds them how great they've done. Um, but it's also important to remember that this is this is a process and it can be difficult for kids. And so um, it shouldn't be negative. If a kid's having struggling, you know, you just say, you know what? let's continue tomorrow or later on. You'll be able to do this. It just, you just need a break. Sometimes kids, I've worked with kids that have drunk so much water that they're full. And it was, it's like, you've drunk this whole bottle of water. Why don't we take a break? Because you're going to not get, you know, it's enough already and we'll continue later on. This is a, um, that I was sh we're showing here is a video um, about how to swallow pills. It's by a doctor named Dr. Bonnie Kaplan. And she has, um, this is actually like a self-learning video you could do with your child. Her approach, she talks a lot about how um, the esophagus, which is the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach, how it works and how with your head in different positions, it might be easier to um, swallow. And she also uses candy. Um, and she says that, um, you know, if you turn your head to the side at the time when you're swallowing, your esophagus physically opens up more. Um, and so she has children practice with their heads in different positions to figure out 
what works best for them. Um, and this is a similar chart to what she shows on the video. And towards the end, we'll try to add this to the chat so that you'll be able to copy it. Um, and if, if it doesn't successfully get added, then you'll, um, when you get a copy of this talk, you'll be able to um, copy and paste it into uh, your search engine and, and get to it. Now, shots are another story and they, can, they also can be difficult for kids. Um, we did a, a, our first talk from the Family Medical Coping Initiative was on um, pokes and blood draws and other kinds of needles. Um, and you can find that on the Children's Hospital YouTube station. Um, and we talk a lot about all different approaches on how to help with help your child with pokes. But for your do, that's pokes at the hospital. When you're talking about doing pokes at home, it can be quite different. And um, there are some things that you can do to make it a little bit easier for your child. One thing is to find out, you can talk to your social worker or your medical staff and see if there's another family who might have a child who'd be willing to um, talk to your child. Um, because a HIPAA, they can't give you the name of the child, but they can ask the family if they're willing to help your child and talk to them, especially a child who has had the same problem and has been successful at being able to incorporate their shot taking into their routine. Um, sometimes just talking to somebody who's done it is can be very, very helpful. Um, making it a routine is part of their daily routine, just like taking pills. Um, being optimistic about their future success. We know this is hard for you now, but you know what, you can do this. And you know, we'll work on it and we'll figure out a way that we can make this happen. Um, and also inviting your child to participate can help be helpful. Let them be part of the, the discussion about, you know, giving choices like our, our if we um, say your child has a new diagnosis of diabetes, like talking about which finger do we poke, giving them options. Um, are we going to have our shot in our right arm or a left arm and our leg, right leg or left leg. Um, also giving explanations as to why they need the shot so that they understand that this is going to help them be healthier. Or for example, with a growth hormone, it's going to help them catch up in their growth to their friends because they'll notice that they're much shorter and smaller than their friends. Um, while they're getting shots, keeping a comfort item close is helpful. Um, offering praises is very helpful, telling them how proud you are, um, providing rewards. And again, it doesn't have to be a purchased reward. It can be something like reading the story, um, offering distraction during the shot, uh, letting them watch TV or a video game, um, and also using numbing cream. Um, that if you ask your physician, they can prescribe a numbing cream that you would put on and it would it takes about 20 minutes for the numbing cream to work, 20 minutes to a half an hour, um, but then it really numbs the skin and it makes it much easier to take. Um, ice packs can be helpful and Buzzy is a, a little, um, you can see here, it's this, it comes in a ladybug or a bee and it vibrates and you use an ice pack. So it really distracts the child from the, the feeling of the shot. Um, I have a friend who's child needed to take uh, growth hormone shots. And the child was very scared of needles at the time. And so she started off with the prescription. And after a few weeks of using the prescription and waiting that her daughter got just very antsy and was, didn't want to be going through this long routine and said, mom, can't we do something else? So they tried ice packs and they put the ice pack on for a minute and then do the shot. And she was like, oh, that's good. That worked. So then, and then eventually she said, you know what, maybe we can try it without the ice pack. And eventually she tried the shot without the ice pack and they were very successful. Um, so it can be something that's weaned off as well. Um, and the other thing that can be very helpful is offering medical play. Um, you can purchase oral syringes, which you, or you may even have them around the house. It's for giving babies medicine. It looks like a syringe um, and allows you to measure, you know, exact amounts of liquid medicine. Um, and kids can pretend those are shots that they're giving to their stuffed animals or their dolls and practicing and being active doing 
medical things can make a child feel um, more in control of their situation and understand things better. Um, another thing that can be hard for kids is using creams and lotions on a regular basis. Um, so caregivers, if they're applying lotion or cream, can pair this um, with a positive activity, which eventually the, the idea of pairing is that the child will eventually make feel like this is a positive thing. So if every time they get their cream applied, they get to watch their favorite TV show, then it becomes a positive event for them. And that's what pairing is. Um, there's also distraction, which can be also a TV show. It can be playing a, a game on their on the phone, or if you have a game system, um, helping your kids' hands be busy. Um, they can use model magic or Play-Doh, or there's, um, uh, what are the, um, fidget toys. They all can keep their, hands busy so that the cream can go on without the child getting involved. Um, playing a song on, on, your, um, on your phone or singing a song, using re relaxation techniques like breathing or thinking about like being on the beach in nice locations. Um, provide, and, and of course, providing simple explanations again for why the cream is necessary. Kids like to know why do they have to go through this? So for all of the medical um, things that they need to do in their plan, it's important for them to understand why they are gonna need to do it and, it and that the explanation be age appropriate. So this cream is gonna make it so your skin doesn't itch or this cream is going to um, make the rash go away. Um, some things you can do to help your child with, um, with their discomfort if, if they have a skin issue is to allow them to wear gloves, which would decrease their um, scratching. Um, also allowing the kids to do here again is medical play. So allowing your child, getting your child like a plastic doll and let them be the doctor or the caregiver and put cream on their dollies, just like their parent puts cream on them. Um, and I suggest getting like some really inexpensive cream because you wouldn't want to waste the prescription on the dolly, of course. Um, the other thing they can do with uh, moisturizer or creams is put it on a paper plate or a tray and let the kids just play with it and draw a picture. They can draw a happy face or, you know, write their numbers or their letters, depending on their age. Um, and during the play, you can model how it helps. So you can talk about how the dolly is not going to be so itchy because they're going to be using, they're putting on the cream. Um, activity restriction is another difficult um, source for kids um, when they've been, you know, when you have a very active kid and all of a sudden they can't participate with their friends in sports or in activities that they like to do. Um, it's important to help them deal with this and um, helping them, you know, discussing with them um, what, why the change is happening and that you understand how hard it is and that you, um, and allow them and help them identify what the issues are and label their feelings. So if they might be frustrated, they might feel like this isn't fair. Why is it happening to them? Um, and, you know, there aren't really answers for why it's happening to them or their frustration, but just the ability to label it and say, you know, I'm angry about this, I'm frustrated, can help. Um, and also for them to understand, again, understand why they need to cut back on their activities. Um, another important thing that caregivers can do is to use empowering language. So talking about um, keeping their child's body safe um, and also focusing on the, not the losses, but focusing on what your child can do and alternative activities, finding positive things that your child can do instead of the activities. Um, you can encourage using coping strategies, um, such as having, if your child would enjoy watching their friends play the sports, some kids might enjoy that. Some might want to have some ongoing involvement in the sport. So maybe talking to the coach and finding out whether or not they can help with some aspect of the, 
sports. So for example, if the coach wants the players to be videotaped so that the kids can watch it after they play, maybe that your child could be the person who does the videotaping um, and shifting from to a new doable activity. So if your child likes to do gymnastics, maybe they would want to take a sewing class or a painting class um, and finding something else they might be interested in. Um, also, a lot of feelings when it comes to this is the fact that kids aren't participating with their friends as much. And so it's important to talk about how they can still be with their friends in ways that are okay for your child's health. So possibly having a pizza movie night at your house or, you know, bring ice cream to the park and inviting their best friends from their sports team so that they're still involved with these friends and they don't lose that connection because you don't want the fact that they can't do um, certain activities to mean that they also are losing their social connection to friends and family or whoever's involved. Okay, so we're going to talk about performing exercises, the kind of exercises that you might perform as part of physical therapy. But before I dive into that, I'm going to make a couple other quick points. One is that each and every one of these areas, such as pill swallowing, could be a whole talk. And actually, we're thinking about next year what um, Annie and Gail and I are going to talk about or what we're going to invite speakers for. We're planning to do a, a whole series of talks uh, next year as part of our family medical coping initiative. Since we were new this year, we were experimenting somewhat, but uh, we're going to do a, a whole series next year. So if anybody has any ideas of what you'd like, would you please put it for us in the chat or in the question and answers? Because we'd really like to know what you'd like to know about. And some of those things could be, especially in the area of pill swallowing, which so many people have been so interested in, we could definitely talk for an hour specifically about that one topic because it is very challenging for a number of families. So um, it would, we would consider it a great help if you let us know what it is you'd like to hear about. And just to recognize that these areas are hard and we are going through them and trying to give you some information, but there really could be a whole talk on one, each and every one of these if that were of interest feel free to tell us and we're going to try to accommodate as many wishes as we can next year. So, and we're going to have a web page. We're working on developing that uh, as part of our summer activities where we would have resources, handouts, you know, some of the, the checklists and sticker charts and also just other things you can do and use and videos you can watch. We're going to try to have that on our web page. So it's not up and running yet, but we are trying to uh, get that going. And if you have ideas of things you'd like to see there, also let us know that. So uh, thank you for that brief diversion. For performing exercises, this is what someone would say, hey, you have to move your body in this way or that way for an, any number of reasons. And often it hurts and it's difficult to do. I know right now I have to do a series of exercises because I hurt my shoulder. So it's, um, it is challenging to get yourself to do something that's hard. So talking about why it's important and what the goal is, is really essential. Making it routine, doing it the same time every day. Um, model doing the exercises. So if your child has to do exercises, do them along with them. Siblings who are willing and uh, able to participate, it also makes it uh, easier for a child to do if, if they have family members that are involved. Making it fun, uh, also very helpful. Very often people do that by adding in songs or uh, watching a distracting uh, video at the same time. Uh, sibling and friends are curious, why are you doing this and trying to get you through it? At the same time, um, for me, I know I listen to Evanescence while I'm doing my exercises. I know that's about the amount of time it's going to take me to do it. Maybe your child has better taste than I do in music or they can pick a song that they like. Uh, I had a patient recently have the whole family sing Old MacDonald as he was doing his exercise as well. Um, again, reminding the child how strong they're going to get or why it's important or how it's going to help their body, how they're not going to, uh, they're going to be more flexible as well. Remind the reason why makes it easier to do it. Uh, following the exercise with something fun in the same way that you might want to, fo to follow a, a liquid that doesn't taste good with a liquid that does. Uh, similarly, an activity that's hard does well with an activity that's fun after. Uh, I once told my doctor, that my daughter's doctor, that we were following um, some poorly tasting medicine with a chaser and she looked at me uh, as though I was saying something terrible, but you think of it as a bridge to something else um, that, they, that they want to get to. 
uh, and pro providing incentives too. But I'm going to say this. The best incentive is having your body work better and have it move better. So when I was 11, I had a very serious compound complex fracture of my left arm. What that means is I broke both bones and one of the bones went through the skin. So it was a pretty serious break. And I was told I might not be able to use my arm again, really, which turned out not to be true. So again, but the doctor I had was very, very positive. And um, he said I had to do these exercises, which I still do to this day. That's how en engaged it was. I always have some kind of ball to squeeze so that I am always increasing my hand strength. That was started with me with my broken arm and is a habit. I've always had a pinky ball or some kind of ball, strength building ball to this day near me that I use because that was built as a habit. But uh, the doctor told me he would always put out two fingers like this and he'd say, squeeze as hard as I could. And um, he would always exaggeratedly say, well, if you were stronger, it would hurt me more. I know that wasn't the best motivator, but it really did motivate me to try to squeeze his hand as hard as I could. And he would do this uh, dramatic, oh, that hurts. And actually, um, I should be embarrassed to say that really motivated me. I did the exercises very devotedly in order to really uh, squeeze his fingers very hard. Um, but I also understood that meant I was getting stronger and that connection with him really made it easier for me to do. I think he was acting now. I wasn't sure then, but um, I do have a much stronger arm, which I'm grateful for. So dietary restrictions, these are so hard. So this is when kids have allergies and um, more and more kids are having allergies to gluten, to peanuts, to any kind of tree nuts. So um, for helping the kids understand what they are allergic to or what they shouldn't eat. Sometimes it's also that they, you know, have restrictions because they have to lose weight or gain weight. Um, so I think this idea of um, figuring out what they can and cannot eat, having them know that. I was very impressed when I took, I think, a seven-year-old out to a restaurant that was a friend of my daughter's, and she asked the wait staff whether they use nuts in preparing their food. So she was just very, very capable and just helping your child, it protects them, especially when they're gonna be in the world alone, to be able to um, read a menu, ask somebody, read, read the ingredients, um, but also um, not only what can't they eat and what should they be on the lookout for, but what are alternative foods for them at a special event? So if they're going to a birthday party and you're not sure that they can eat the pizza or the cake, having something for them to eat is also very helpful. Um, helping the whole family follow the restrictions. I know that's hard and sometimes it's not always possible. I have a family where one, um, one of the parents and one of the children are following the restrictions and the other kids aren't, but it, even to have one person who has the same restrictions is very useful for kids. Uh, reduce the availability of inappropriate foods. So if your child's not supposed to eat that much sugar, if there are tons of uh, candy in the house, it's really hard for them to resist and makes it feel, feel harder for them. Um, consider support groups and camps to meet other kids with the same ki kinds of restrictions. I've had kids go to camps where they have diabetes to uh, Clara Barton or Jocelyn Camp and just seeing what other people eat and how they follow their medical routines has been enormously helpful. Um, empathize about the challenges in having a diet where they either have to eat more or restrict and um, how, um, how that hard that is to follow. Find fun ways to uh, prepare healthy foods. Look at all these choices we put out for you, but if kids grow their own uh, vegetables or fruit or they um, are involved in preparing it, that definitely makes it more fun. And um, also if you make it in fun ways, these are some just some ideas we had for you about making food fun. Liquid restrictions and requirements. Of course, there's a, um, the hard thing for kids who are on dialysis is they have to restrict liquids. And then if they get a transplant, they have to add and drink more than one would be expected to drink. So it's a challenge even with the same child sometimes to have to restrict what they drink and then have to add a lot to what they drink. So again, this, these are very hard for kids and families and to think about how to do it. The first thing is to provide some education. What is a fluid? So sometimes there's liquid and things that don't seem like a drink. So uh, some education there and um, involving kids in planning the daily amount they're either allowed or supposed to drink. So I had a patient and uh, it always cracked me up. Um, she would have, instead of drinking out of a regular water bottle, she found that very hard. She had a pineapple shaped water bottle and it was just so much easier for her to drink two pineapples than it was to drink two water bottles. And so making sure um, she had her pineapple at the ready and a spare one because she actually did lose the pineapple and then her liquid intake went down. So 
Uh, again, finding ways to make it fun is always a useful thing to do. Offering distraction, especially if you're trying to get them to drink more, if they're watching a show, having the water bottle ready, if you want them to drink more. Uh, encouraging coping skills and thinking about what they think about. So if kids have to have only a limited amount of liquid, they often feel like they're very thirsty and they have a distortion. They can become distorted about how thirsty they are. So thinking about relaxation and calming techniques. Uh, talk backs to unhelpful self-talk. So that was, that's a lot of um, shenanigans uh, in the way we put that. But what I mean by that is if they're thinking, wow, I'm never going to be able to drink anything. So remember at two o'clock, you're going to have something to drink. Uh, measuring the intake so you know how much they are getting, whether you are trying to increase or trying to decrease. Uh, risk for restricting liquids. I've learned this from many of my colleagues. Um, um, at the CAT CR and you know, wherever they are going or dialysis. So remember using gum, hard candy, small containers, small drink glasses, frozen fruit, little amounts at a time. Obviously, partner with your doctor about this or your doctor, your nurse, your child life specialist, your social worker about what it is you can and if you're having troubles, how to get how to get a plan that's going to go to help your child restrict that fluid intake. Uh, to add fluid, obviously getting big glasses, carrying a water bottle, drinking throughout the day. There's nothing like a really fun straw to make uh, kids want to drink more. So making it routine to drink a certain amount and having it be fun always helps, or often helps, I should say. Off to you, Annie. So the other thing that can really be helpful, as many of you already know, is finding books um, that help you and your child see other kids in a similar situation or provide some tips. So here are uh, some sites, children's books that explore medical needs. Um, it's a great site. And also 10 great children's books for talking specifically about surgery, sickness, and feelings. And as we said in the beginning, you know, feelings are a very important part of all this. There's no uh, wrong feelings or bad feelings about um, having to engage in a medical plan of care. That's the other thing is all feelings are good, even if they're hard to handle. I think it's, it's finding ways um, to cope with those feelings, to acknowledge them and um, to grapple with them and to move ahead. And books can be incredibly helpful guides. Um, we've also mentioned encourage your child to meet people with a similar diagnosis. We've talked a little bit about uh, camps, which are listed here, but peers can also often be um, really helpful with coping. As we know, um, children seeing people their own age doing some of the things that they have to do and that it doesn't feel just composed by adults can, can be incredibly helpful empowering and they can learn new ways of doing things from each other, um, which is really tremendous. This happens in support groups and as I mentioned, medical camps, and you can check with local foundations representing your child's illness or disability or talk with a social worker if you have access to them. And we also just want to say thank you for coming. Um, there is one more question in the chat. So we have time for this. Thank you. Uh, would you talk about preparing a child for surgery or any procedure that involves long hours of fasting? Well, we had it. That's such a good question. And we actually are thirsty. Yeah. Yep, it's very hard. Please. Very hard. And we were planning to do one. one. One that we have an idea of is preparing for surgery, but really remembering that concept of... Um, you know, having to go long hours without eating and drinking to make sure to incorporate it in. I think that's a great idea. Um, it w and I I'm guessing uh, this person might have wanted us to talk a little bit more about that today. I don't know if there's anything else that you can say about that briefly about helping helping a child um, with with long hours of fasting. Well, yeah, yes, no, absolutely. That's absolutely the case. It is, it is really hard. I, I think first of all, preparing, like going to the My Hospital story and having, making sure the child's completely prepared uh, as well as you can for the surgery, given their developmental level, 
Um, but I, I, I think having distraction is probably the best thing you can do and distraction and keeping them busy, even a schedule for the day. Here's what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to do next, reminding them what's, what's coming up. Here's what's going to happen. But it's hard, especially if you have a time you think you're going to have the surgery and then it winds up becoming later and later and later. It's really challenging. I think the distraction is a, um, distraction is a key and also finding out from your doctor are there any uh, are there any like I know when I recently had surgery they said I could drink small amounts of water so I'm wondering if you also talk to your doctor specifically about that challenge if there was a chance that they could have gum or something else or some or even a chew toy sometimes I think uh, like I don't know if you have jewelry that that's something you might use something especially if a child has uh, struggles with verbal skills, like something they can chew or fidget with, but the chewing especially, um, chew toys, chew, jewelry, I know they seem ridiculous, but you can find some beautiful jewelry online where they can just even suck on that. Feels like you have something in your mouth, makes it feel a little better. I don't know if there are any other suggestions either. Yeah, you have some, sometimes they'll allow ice chips, um, you know, to suck on yeah. little bits of ice chips. But the other thing is to bring to the hospital things that your child enjoys doing. Um, if they like playing cards, bring card games. If they enjoy um, playing games on the phone, make sure you have your charger with you. Um, um, if they, whatever games they like, just pack a bag of the things that they will like doing um, and talk to them about it. Make a plan together um, and fill that bag together, you know, so that we, we're going to have three hours of waiting. Let's figure out what are we going to do during those three hours and bring those things along to do. If they like coloring, bring crayons and coloring books. Um, if they like puzzles, whatever it is that they enjoy doing, bring along. The children's the Boston Children's Hospital um, Child Life Department does have different toys and activities that they can lend out. But if your child, it's not necessarily what your child loves. So I suggest if your child has favorite things, bring them with you because that way you'll know that they have the things available. And, and that planning ahead can be very, very helpful. And I, I know it's different depending on the child, but some kids like, like I had one child who used to bring a bag that was only brought for um, surgery. It was a special toys. And then uh, other kids who like to bring something that's very familiar from home. And then others that really benefit because they're anxious from something novel that they've never seen before. So that you have some special tricks you can take out of your, your bag of tricks to have almost like your own coping your own coping kit that you bring to the hospital to get through it. But I think in knowing your own child, you'll know whether they would want to have a standard thing they always bring for their procedures if they're having a lot of procedures, whether it would be something that they often play with that's a comfort item or whether novelty would really help. Right. On, on the novelty, um, there are a few things I've suggested to families is getting some little, actually this even for traveling is great if you're taking a child on a long trip, um, buying a few little toys and then wrapping them so that the child doesn't see them. And then every certain amount of time, they get to pick something um, to unwrap and they get this little present. I mean, it doesn't have to be expensive. It shouldn't be expensive. It just is something fun to see. Um, my son was very, uh, really, really loved basketball cards. And so it, when he had a procedure periodically, I would go out and buy a few packs of basketball cards and we would open them very slowly, <laughs> one card at a time and talk about the player and talk about um, what team he was on and whether or not he, you know, will this player be, um, you think, is he on the Celtics or, you know, um, what does he know about it? And then we'd read the back of the card and we would really take the time to um, learn about the basketball players. And so we were able to expand our time with basketball players and it made it easier. So depending on your child's interest, those are things that can, can really help. And the, um, he loved the surprise of not knowing what he was going to get in those basketball card packs. So I know we, I'm sorry to cut in. I know we only have like about one minute left, but Elisa, you did mention, and Gail, you might have too, my hospital story. And yeah. I just, if, if one of you can say briefly about kind of what that is and where it can, where they can be found on our website, that would be great. Gail, can you do that in a second? But I just want to say one other thing about the, why that's so important, which is 
sometimes if you've gone over and made a social story for your child ahead of time with a checklist of what you're going to do and you've reviewed so they know what they're doing then you can bring that with you along and that can reduce anxiety too so okay well first we went to the garage then we went to the front desk and then we waited in the waiting room we saw this like, like you can almost do it as a checkoff list and that becomes one of the activities too and um that's so critical for them to know what's going on and thank you for that great question yeah. Um, Gail, do you want to say more about my yeah, hospital Yeah, um, so the My Hospital stories are, um, if you go to the Boston Children's Hospital website and you search either for child life or for getting ready for your hospital visit, um, there'll be a link to My Hospital stories, um, which is preparing to come to the hospital. And then there'll be a list of stories for all different kinds of visits and procedures. Um, and the stories are written um, in first person and they have photographs of a child who is entering the hospital, going to the um, check-in desk. They see photos of the child going into one of the procedure rooms. Um, they have pictures of some of the people who work there. If they're still there, you may recognize them. Um, and it goes through the whole process of what's going on. Um, and so reading those stories can be incredibly helpful to prepare your child for what's gonna happen. And also um, so, uh, sort of give them guidance as to, you know, you're gonna stand there quietly and wait until your name is called, or you're gonna sit in the chair um, until, and then we're gonna take you to a different room. And then a nurse is gonna um, weigh you and see how tall you are and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a great step-by-step -step preparation guide for different areas of the hospital. Great, thank you. And thank you everybody for coming today and for joining us. And um, you will hear about future webinars um, and we hope you join us for those as well. Thank you.